So good morning, everyone. Uh, really nice to be back in Ukraine. Um, it's, it's really beautiful. Um, I'm, I'm David Scott. Uh, I'm, uh, well, I just graduated from my master's at the University of Helsinki. And from September, um, as the board says, uh, I'll be undertaking a PhD at the University of Manchester. Um, so I've, I've given you my, my two emails here, unfortunately, um, because there's a transition. It's hard to tell which one to contact me through. Um, I should say that I, I apologize for not being at the networking event last night. Um, and I'll actually be leaving on Friday morning, so I won't be at the networking event on Saturday either. So just to put it out there, if anyone wants to get in contact about the Jessup, about anything we talk about in this class, about postgraduate study, about um, working in international law, internships, just want to talk about things, um, feel free to drop me an email. I'm happy to grab coffee or something, because we might not get that, um, that chance somewhere else. So uh, you are welcome to yeah, david.scott.helsinki.fee. Um, please drop me an email. Uh, it's, it's, it's great to see so many people here um, so sort of enthused about the Jessup. So uh, if there's anything at all I can do to help, um, just let me know. Uh, so I will be teaching um, four classes. Um, they're a little bit different to how they're described in the booklet, but everything will be covered sort of um, in the end. Um, so today I really just want to try and introduce you to the Jessup, considering the, um, only a sort of handful of you have direct experience. Um, it would be good to just sort of make sure everyone is on the same uh, playing field and everyone understands what the competition requires. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the Jessup and about legal research. Um, tomorrow we'll go more into the actual putting together of the argumentation in the Jessup, how one writes a memorial, how one argues. Um, and then on Wednesday, don't be put off by the, the title. Um, I, I want to treat that class sort of with my Jessup manifesto. Everyone has a different way of approaching uh, the Jessup. And um, mine has been quite informed by, by sort of theoretical approaches, which I don't think is something that's often discussed in the Jessup. So um, my hope is that I can kind of show you some other ways of looking at the Jessup and how to uh, prepare for that and think about international law in general. Um, and then there'll be a practical exercise on Thursday. Don't worry about that. We'll talk about it um, later today. Uh, it's nothing scary. Uh, I promise. <laughs> um, so yeah, they, just a few things I want to cover. Uh, quite a lot of it will, might be boring if you've heard this before, but just to ensure that everyone knows the same thing. So just going through what is the Jessup, what kind of resources are available for you um, to get started with this, what to do when you first receive the company, how to tackle it, how to turn that into legal issues that you will then argue for the remainder of the year, how to actually go about researching international law, and then a short kind of starting introduction um, to written arguments. I should say I'll, I'll circulate the PowerPoint either after each class or at the end of the week so you don't feel that you need to write every single um, link down or anything. A um, little introduction, um, I have been involved in the Jessup for three years. Um, I was a competitor for the University of Helsinki, uh, Finland, the first year of my Masters, um, and I had some previous experience meeting uh, at the University of Glasgow in a human rights moot. I then served as a coach for the University of Helsinki in 2015, and as a sort of long distance coach uh, last year. And I've also judged in Brazil, I judged in the Ukrainian rounds this year, and I've also judged um, the European friendly rounds in Budapest, which are for all the countries that don't have national rounds. Um, so I've kind of seen every side of the bench, I suppose. I've been the coach, the team member, and the judge. Um, so hopefully I can give you some sort of information on what the Jessup is really about from kind of behind the scenes. Um, oh, sorry. Picture diary. Uh, at the top left is me, it's the Council of Europe. Uh, the top Right and middle are uh, my, my Jessup team when we were in DC, that's was outside the White House. Uh, the bottom left is um, the team I coached last year, and there's a picture of me abusing my privilege as a coach. And uh, the bottom right uh, was me judging um, last year here in Ukraine in the semi-final round, uh, doing my best impression of Lenny and Simpsons. Um, it's kind of uncanny when I laid them over each other, how close they are. Anyway, what is the Jessup? Um, so the Jessup is the largest international law, well, it's the largest moot court competition in the world. The Vice claims that they are the largest moot court competition in the world. They are lying, don't believe it. Uh, the Vice has the largest international rounds. 
but in terms of actual competitors across the world, it is the Jessup. Uh, as I said last year, there were over 550 law schools in more than 87 countries that competed. Um, so when the company is released in September, uh, it's kind of incredible to think that there will be 550, over 550 law schools all working on the same problem. Uh, that's, you know, thousands of people around the world who, if you bump into them in the future, will remember their, like, Jessup experience. They'll remember the case that they did. Um, and it's, yeah, it's been running for, well, this year will be the 59th year. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's incredible that it's, it's, it's grown to the size it has and it seems to keep growing. So you're, you're, you're really joining a, a, a venerable tradition. Um, I can't, I've kind of lost count of the number of times I'll, I've met people, you know, professors or judges or um, people working in international organizations and they'll say, oh, I did the Jessup 35 years ago. I still remember my case. I still remember arguing it. So it's, it's a really great thing to be involved in. Um, the international rounds this year are scheduled um, already. Um, it is a public international law moot, and uh, the case it is a fake case that is pled before the ICJ. Um, that makes them basic, but we'll get into why that is important um, throughout the week. And the topics for this year's competition have already, already been announced, um, so if you want to get a kind of head start on research, uh, these are the four um, issues. They're quite unusual ones, so the validity of interstate arbitral awards, Capture maritime vessels, the breach of nuclear disarmament obligations, and the conduct of naval warfare. Um, that always changes by the time the eventual compromise comes out. Um, but if you can get a head start and look into some of these issues, uh, it, it certainly wouldn't help, uh, hurt your chances. Uh, this is the ICJ, the Peace Palace in The Hague. There's the current bench. I think that's the current bench. That's the most up-to-date photo I could find from 2015. They don't seem to like being photographed together, but um, uh, that seems to be the most up-to-date one. Um, I've actually been living in The Hague, so that is me beside the Peace Palace. Um, and if you can ever visit it, um, you should visit it first of all because if you join the library, the library only costs 30 euro to join for the year, and you get access to loads of journals and things online, and you can actually access them from outside the library. So if any of you have a, a, a chance to go through The Hague, um, I would absolutely recommend joining the library. But I'd also go and see um, these two things. On the left um, is a statue called The Cat That Saved International Peace and Justice. Um, so before the ICJ, there was the Permanent Court of International Justice, uh, the PCIJ. And um, there's a story that in 1924, uh, the justices were the only people in the building, and a fire broke out. Uh, supposedly, a lantern was knocked over by a seagull. That's what the, the, the story goes. And there was a cat that lived on the grounds that um, climbed into the president's chambers, woke the president up, uh, convinced the other, it managed to get the other judges awake. They came out into the corridor and there was fire spreading through the court. Um, and that was blocking the door. The judges thought they were going to die. And the cat apparently led them to a secret passageway in one of the judges' rooms that none of them knew about. It had been built um, and installed by the builders. No one knew it existed. And the cat led them all to safety. Uh, but it sadly died of smoke inhalation. Uh, after leaving them all out. So the, the um, justices of the court petitioned to have this statue built. Uh, it's about seven feet high. I don't really do justice. It's sort of a car in the background. You can see for scale. But it's gigantic. Um, and yeah, so that's a sort of life-saving cat. Um, on the right, there's also a pig on the grounds. I, I don't understand that. There's just a farm. So I would recommend going and seeing that um, while you're there. Uh, it's not the sort of thing you would expect to see at the ICJ, but, you know, uh, international laws are weird. World to move in. So, um, just a competition. You will be part of a team of up to five students, uh, and you are to prepare, the first stage is to prepare two memorials, uh, each of around 9,000 words, uh, which is yeah, around 40 pages plus um, a number of other kind of requirements that you have to fill, um, and those will be submitted by around early January. Um, there will then be the national rounds held in late February or March. I don't know if Ukraine um, has decided yet when yours will be. Um, initially, each team will compete in four rounds. Two is the applicant and two is the respondent. And um, you'll be scored. There's a, there's a score sheet um, which determines how the points are given. And on a mixture of your memorial scores and your oral round scores, uh, the four top highest scoring teams will um, progress to, or the, it depends on how many teams there are, it could be eight, will progress to the, the quarterfinals, the semifinals, 
Um, and from that stage on, it's only on the basis of oral presentation. So the first round of your memorials are important, but once you get through that, it's only a winner or a loser between the two teams, and that team progresses until you have a final and you win. Um, I think last year Ukraine sent two teams to international rounds and one exhibition team. Um, so essentially you just need to get to the final if you want to qualify. I should say that the, the, the standard in Ukraine, as I'm sure you're all aware, is very high. I was um, unbelievably impressed by how good uh, the standard was when I judged last year or this year. So um, it's, it's hard to get to that final, but um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sure you can, you can do it. So once you've done that, got through to the final, talk to teams, go to the international rounds, and then the structure is basically the same. The, the, there will be four rounds each, and then scoring, and then there's, I think, uh, thir top 32, top 16, top 8, top 4, and then the final. Um, so, it can seem kind of difficult to work out how to start with the Jessup. I mean, there's so much to consider how to write the memorial, how to uh, present your, your case, how to um, even just what it means to stand in front of a, a, a group of judges and speak in a way that is, is convincing. So what I want to spend the first kind of half of the lecture is just going through some of the resources that are available to you, some of the things that you can go and look at um, in your own time. Uh, I wouldn't recommend trying to read all of this at once. There's hundreds of pages of guides. Um, but if you have some sort of questions about how things work, uh, these are some of the best kind of starting points. And then as you go through, if you are um, on the Jessup team, uh, as you go through, you can kind of check against these guides um, as you go and make sure that uh, you know, your, your work is kind of staying to the, the, the standard that, that ILSA suggests. Um, so the first one is the ILSA website. The ILSA website has page after page um, of Jessup information. Um, I just want to walk you through some of the most important ones. So, as you can see here, I know we have a laser pointer, so I've had to just put some paint arrows in. Um, there's a Jessup tab. If you go there, it says Resort, Research Resources. Uh, if you click that tab, it takes you to a page. And this has um, basically all the information you can get about how to research international law, uh, how ILSA prefers the, prefers the memorial to be written, um, and sort of a general explanation of some of the uh, requirements in Jessup. The first one that is at the top, there's the White and Case Jessup Guide. White and Case are the sponsors of the Jessup. If you click, there's a hyperlink somewhere, it will take you to this page, which is their page in the Jessup competition, and if you scroll down, uh, there's a section on um, their guide. So there's a guide for competitors. This has um, a whole bunch of uh, PDF files, each about um, 10 pages long, which explains uh, some of the key things you have to master at the start of the Jessup. So working with Compromis, uh, researching international law, how to write the memorials, how to do oral pleadings, and then also something about um, how the Jessup can inform your legal career uh, going on uh, after the competition. Um, there are also a number of videos. Uh, these, are, these are really useful. They're all only about four minutes long, and it specifies um, certain parts of how the oral, oral proceedings uh, take place. So, for example, it shows how um, you can roadmap an argument. This is something we'll talk about tomorrow. Uh, how to use IRAC, how to deal with judges. Um, it gives you examples from the, I think it's actually videos from the final rounds, where the judges will ask a question, and they'll show a competitor answering that question. that will kind of give you an idea of, of, of what all this looks like. Um, there's also a judges training guide. Um, when you're preparing for the oral rounds, it's worth having a look at this, uh, because it gives you a perspective on how the Jessup is run, or how an oral, an oral round is run from the judge's perspective, and how the scoring works from the judge's perspective. So it can be useful to, um, to watch these videos to get a sense of who your audience is and how your audience are kind of understanding your pleadings, how they score against them. Um, so if we go back to the ILSA website, so the White and uh, Case Jessup guy is there. If you scroll down, there are another four um, really important paragraphs. The top one uh, is a link to the final round videos. Um, the Jessup, the ILSA has been filming the final round for the last uh, five or six years, I believe. Um, and you can buy access to the, the final rounds on um, their Vimeo account, which is linked there. I think you're, you're, you're seeing one of the finals on Friday. I think one of the events is that you're viewing a final round. Yeah. Um, I hope it's this year's. This year and last year's finals were brilliant. 
um, the benches were, uh, Bruno Sima was in the bench for both of them, and this year they had James Crawford as well. Um, sometimes the final rounds, the older final rounds, can be a little bit boring. Sometimes the, um, I just remembered on camera, oh, this doesn't, uh, go back to Ilsa. Um, sometimes the final rounds can be a little bit boring because the judges just want to, to make sure that people can speak coherently, that they have an understanding of the law, they just kind of let them have their speech. But the last two years they've had very active benches. Um, I think two years ago one of the American teams was quizzed on uh, how to interpret the Ten Commandments as a legal concept, how we interpret the terms of a, in terms of the, um, applying the VCLT to the Ten Commandments, how you would. So they're, they're great fun if you can watch the last two, two years. Um, some of your coaches might already have access to these as well. They, they sell the DVDs at the competition. And I would definitely recommend if your university competes a lot, um, I mean, the DVDs can be expensive, but it's worth um, Helsinki, where I coached, we had a collection of two or three of them, and we would make a point of showing our teams around January, February, what the final standard was normally like. So it's, it's well worth the investment for your university to be able to show you what the kind of final standard is of some of these teams. So that's the final round of videos. Um, the next section, there's an introduction to international law, which uh, is a sort of very basic introduction to uh, what the law is, um, the definition of international law, who some of the key actors are, where the key sources are. Um, it's only about 10 pages long. It's worth Skim reading this if you don't have a background in international law, I would highly suggest this is a good place to start. Um, it will give you a sense of, of exactly what the subject of this moot is. Below that, there's um, uh, another short guide for memorial writing. Again, this is only um, nine pages. As you say, the, the white case ones are much more comprehensive, um, but it's good to compare both of them because the, the white case one is often more about the practice. It's about how to write convincingly, how to plead convincingly. The ILSA one is more closely about how the Jessup has graded itself, what the Jessup expects of your written memorial. So it's worth reading these two sort of side by side to ensure that you're kind of getting the full picture. The last guide that we give you is one that was published by, I'm going to get this name right, it was the Chinese Center for Chinese Initiative on International Criminal Justice. Uh, and it was written by former competitors and academics. It was written by people who have won. Um, pleading awards, who have won written memorial awards, written by former judges. Um, it's about 100 pages long. Uh, it's incredibly comprehensive. Don't try and read it all in one sitting, but it is really useful for going through some of the kind of the, the actual um, on the ground experiences of what it means to plead. It's easy to talk about how to do an oral round, but this actually has some, some quite in-depth knowledge of if you ask this sort of question, how to respond to it, um, exactly how to address the judges, how to kind of move on from arguments, how to keep structure. Um, so this is, this is a really good resource. Um, go back to the ILSA website, there's also an FAQ, um, which just kind of goes through some of the basics of the competition, how the competition is structured. Um, yeah, there's some information on, on the resources available um, and sort of what you, your deadlines, things like that. So it's also worth consulting this if you have any outstanding questions. Um, the other brilliant resource uh, that you have and this video is hopefully a contribution to is the Jessup Ukraine um, YouTube account. The lecturers from last year's summer school are here and they're absolutely brilliant. I, I watched them prepare for this. Um, so as you can see, there's a little arrow there. It's lecture three, um, but there's, there's uh, three lectures, one on a similar instruction like this, one specifically on writing and one specifically on oral argumentation. Um, I'm going to try and skim over the argumentation a little more broadly because I'm aware that these are already here. So if you're more interested in actually how to kind of write, I would highly recommend um, watching these videos. Um, there's also footage from the final round from this year's Nationals, um, which I unfortunately haven't seen, but I know people who are on the bench and the, the bench were good. And I know that the final, the, the, the two teams that um, advanced were both of an excellent quality. So I would also highly recommend watching this. Um, it's probably as as valuable as watching um, some of the final rounds from the, the international jest itself. Um, so, let's actually try and, and talk through what a year in the Jessup is like. Um, you are selected by your university, by whatever process that involves, um, and as I said at the start, you can have um, up to five members in your team, but that's not a requirement. Um, some teams have as few as two members who just do everything themselves. Um, again, that would be something that your university probably has an idea of how they would like to organize it. 
Within those five people, there's a number of ways that you can divide the workload. Um, and again, your coaches may have um, quite strong views on this. Um, so the way that Helsinki organized it, um, I should say that, that Finland doesn't have a national round. Helsinki is the only university that competes. So we automatically qualify for the international rounds. So there's always been less of a competitive pressure in Helsinki. So for us, we would pick five people, and everyone would plead. That was the agreement. Unless someone absolutely did not want to plead, everyone got to plead. Everyone got the, the experience uh, of doing that. And it just meant that um, because there are two oralists on each side, an applicant and respondent, um, one team would have an alternate. So for example, in the first two rounds, we had three applicants. So one round that would be you know, the same applicant one and two, but applicant three and four would swap. Um, that one is good because it means everyone's equally engaged and it means that everyone gets the, the, the kind of full gest of experience. The downside is that the individuals that have to alternate uh, unfortunately won't be eligible for any of the speakers' awards because to be, there's, there's the, they rank the speakers at the end of the international competition and if you are in the top 100, they kind of put you on a list and if you're in the top 10, you get a, a trophy. Um, and, but to do that, you have to plead in more than two rounds. So if you do the alternate route, the downside is that the people who alternate will not be up for those, those awards. That's just something to consider. Obviously, if you just have four pleaders, that's not a problem. Everyone pleads. Uh, there's no issue. You can also have four pleaders and one researcher. Um, I've seen teams do that quite successfully. Uh, I've seen teams advertise for that, where they, they, the way they actually pick their Jessup team is that they kind of pick people who are good speakers, but they will also have people who have a background in international law or a strong grounding in international law or a strong research interest, and it means that they, if they don't want to speak, that's fine, and they kind of act as the general um, research person for everyone. The other uh, approach that you see quite frequently is that you have two pleaders who will plead both sides. So someone will prepare, will, will prepare submissions one and two, some will prepare submissions three and four, and they will plead both applicant and respondent. The benefit of that is that they will have a really deep knowledge because you have to understand both sides' arguments. So you, you, you know, those pleaders will, um, will know every single part of the argument on both sides. Uh, and it also means that if you have two exceptional speakers, then you know that they're going to be consistently good, um, particularly in competitive national rounds like, like in Ukraine. Uh, it's obviously very important that every round is a high-scoring round because it can be a very small number of points between you qualifying and not qualifying. So some teams like to have their two best speakers up front and, um, and pleading every round so you know that the, the score will be high. Um, the downside of this is that they don't... There's a benefit to having the teams separated into applicant and respondent because you'll have in your mind that you're the applicant and you can kind of believe your own argument. If you're pleading both sides, there's sometimes a tendency to be too academic or to, to show that you know too much information and to not really be convincing in pleading your state's case. Um, there's obviously ways that you can train around that, and it, for exceptional speakers, it doesn't matter. But it's just something to consider that there are benefits to having four because you can really divide it um, and, and kind of fit the narrative that you are the, the applicant, that you believe that argument and you only know that argument. Um, and that you only, you only think that argument is correct, that, that can also kind of psychologically help the performance of the team. Um, that, however, is kind of the oral rounds. The early research is, is normally structured much different. When the company first lands, it's the five of you scrabbling to understand what is going on and, and what you need to do. Um, there are also a number of ways you can approach this. Uh, one way is that each person takes a submission and prepares applicant and respondent on that issue. The other is that you divide the team early on, so you decide who is applicant and who is respondent, and they prepare submissions one and two and submissions three and four. So in, one, in the, the first example, you're more uh, giving the attention to each submission individually. In the other example, you're already starting to think as oral pleaders. Um, Again, there are benefits and downsides. Um, you get deeper research if someone is taking on one submission, but you might miss some of the more convincing uh, elements of the argument or some of the, the, the elements where facts have to be bent to fit legal arguments. If you're just researching an issue, if you're just researching humanitarian law, 
um, it's easy to get lost in that. Whereas if you know that you're researching humanitarian law and you have to find these answers because you are the applicant, then that makes it kind of easier to spot the things that you're looking for. And it also means that you already have the opposition. You already have someone challenging your arguments, saying, have you seen this case? Have you read this book? Um, again, your coaches might have, have views on this, but it's something to think about within your team. Um, how you think, and particularly if you know the people in your team, how you think you'll work best, whether you'll work best collectively, or whether you'd rather kind of start the competition early and really start kind of working against each other. Um, so yeah, while the oral rounds are competitive and morals are submitted together, um, and it's, it's, it's important to, to make sure that you're not, um, just essentially that there aren't any missing gaps in your research, because when you actually get down to writing, you need to make sure that, that everyone know, you know you'll, you'll be experts quicker than your coaches by the time you're writing the memorial. And it'll be up to you to make sure that the memorials are legally correct and that they are, are as persuasive as possible. So it's just worth considering what the, the, the best way is for you to kind of reach. So the company itself, have you all received the company for your... Perfect, okay. Uh, it's a difficult company. I'm quite impressed. Uh, they, they're expecting a lot of you. Um, I was sat in um, the library in The Hague actually a couple of days ago with um, an ex Jessup competitor and an ex Jessup coach. And we were all debating how we would argue some of the, some of the, the issues. We were really stuck on some of the issues. So um, I, I have great respect that you're, uh, you're, you're going to be working through that. Um, the one that you have is about half the length of what a normal compromise is, I would say. They're normally around 30 ish pages in length and they cover four submissions, not two. Um, they normally include a list of relevant treaties um, that your parties are uh, party to, or your states are party to, um, and that's a closed list. This is important, and we'll, we'll focus on this more tomorrow and on Wednesday. But um, the treaties that are in the Compromis are an exhaustive list. You can't cite another treaty that your states aren't party to. Um, one of the biggest kind of stumbling block mistakes you see teams make is standing up and they're saying, I found this treaty that clearly answers the question, but neither state is a party to it. Or more problematically, only one state is a party to it. Um, so, you, you know, you really need to, to focus only on those treaties that actually bind your state. Um, sometimes there are also fake treaties written into the case. So for example, the year that I competed, there was a discussion of natural, it was mineral resources, and there was a treaty that governed how those resources were extracted and sold to the other state. Um, those normally have a basis in some kind of real treaty or some kind of existing case law that you can find. But either way, it's not a, a, a treaty that exists outside the, the case itself. Um, sometimes there are also jurisdictional questions. Um, does anyone know what a jurisdictional question is? It's an interactivity. Can someone tell me what a jurisdictional question would be in the, in the course of the Jessup? Yes. Yeah, so sometimes there are, there are, and it's not just jurisdictional, sometimes there are also evidentiary questions or other. Um, last year's case, not, um, not last year, sorry, the year before, had a whole case about whether, ev a whole submission about whether evidence could be brought before the court. Um, yeah, an admissibility. It was, yeah, an admissibility of evidence question. Um, so just these are things to think about. It's not just a question of law, it's not just a question of textbooks, sometimes you need to understand the actual functioning of the ICJ. Um, so this kind of leads to the most important point. This is perhaps the golden rule of Jessup. The compromise is king. You cannot challenge the compromise. The compromise within the universe of the Jessup, this always starts to sound ridiculous when you talk about it. You have, you have to imagine that the, that the Jessup exists and that you, you really are you know, an Appalachian citizen. You're the Appalachian legal advisor. You're the best person in your country. You've climbed through Appalachian law school and you're now before the ICJ to plead your case. The, the compromise that has been submitted before the ICJ has been agreed by your state and by the other state. So you can't say that the compromise is wrong because your government agreed to it. 
and you can't stand in front of the court and say, well, our government actually didn't mean this. Um, you can obviously, well, we'll, we'll, we'll get to how that's different, but you can't challenge the content of the compromise. You also can't invent things. You can't say, uh, you know, oh, well, we also could have done this. So, for example, quite often cases of something about like a riot, and you might say, and the compromise will say, you know, riots happened, and then the riot stopped. And so often people will stand up in front, of the, in front of the bench and they'll say something like, well, the riot stopped because we sent police into the, the region and they uh, reached out to the community. At, if it's not in the company, you, you can't make things up. You can't hypothesize about what your government might have done. Because if it was a factual thing that did occur, it would be in the company. Your state would have put it there. So you can't make things up. Um, exiting the Jessup universe for a second and looking at it from an external perspective. The compromise is also written in a deliberately ambiguous way. It's not written to provide easy answers to either side. So to some extent, it's also not worth challenging things that don't help you or aren't clear or, you know, if there's a fact where if you think, oh, if it was only this, then my argument would make sense. That's probably deliberate. Um, so you need to learn how to engage with those ambiguities and how to shape them without flat out lying. Um, now to nuance this a little bit more. While everything in the compromise is factually has been agreed and that you can't challenge it, it doesn't mean that you can't challenge the characterization of certain facts in the compromise. One of the crucial things to look out for is who in the compromise is stating something. So if the compromise says, and unfortunately I don't actually have the compromise from the problem for uh, this week's, but um, if the compromise says factually, on June 8th this happened, you can't challenge that fact, that happened. But if it says, President such and such stated, we did this because, that factually occurred but it doesn't mean that it's true. Does that distinction make sense? Or if a newspaper reports something, the fact that the compromise says that the newspaper reported it is true. I can say that, you know, the New York Times published something today. It doesn't mean that what the New York Times published is factually correct. And there are kind of rules that govern how the ICJ deals with evidence like that, which we'll talk more about on um, tomorrow on Wednesday. But it, it's worth trying to get that, put those lenses on when you're reading the compromise. So the compromise is fact, and you can't challenge it, but you can challenge some of the assessments of facts that are within the compromise itself. Just make sure that you're not crossing those over, because judges hate when parties try to lie about the compromise. It's one of the easiest ways to, if not lose a round, at least lose a lot of points, is if you stand up and make something up or try and... Um, try and bend the facts in a way that just the company clearly doesn't support. Um, so, the company is released in September. It's 30 pages long. You print it out and you put it on your desk. What do you do next? Um, you're going to have a full lecture on this tonight, so I'm not going to focus too much. There's a number of different approaches. One of the ones that people suggest is to start at the end. So they suggest that you look at the submissions, you understand what the submissions say, and then you go through and you highlight every time that, you know, drone strike comes up, you know, the drone strike is in it, highlight that. I personally don't think that makes sense. Or rather, I understand why people do it, but I think sometimes that immediate focus means that you lose sight of the actual case itself. Again, think about the Jessup case as a universe that you're entering into. These states actually exist. They've existed for hundreds of years. They have, you know, connections and a history. And when you read the first few pages of the company, often it's, you know, these states have a, a border. They are on the sea. One of them is developing. One of them is developed. And you kind of can't work out what the relevance of this is. But often when you get to preparing your oral arguments in February, you'll suddenly realize that there's a fact that totally changes the characterization of the entire case. That 
For example, last year's case, this was one that I thought was really interesting. Last year's case was about a drought. I don't know if anyone saw this. Uh, and the whole thing was about whether, oh, we don't have water, we have to use this underground resource. We take the water out, the resource dep dep depletes, we don't, it, it won't replenish. In the first paragraph of the compromise, it stated that the two countries were coastal countries, that there was a sea. So few teams seem to take that into account. The, the good teams did, but often you'd ask a team, so you need this water, but you, you're, uh, there's a sea, there's a giant sea, can you not filter that? And they would just stand and go, oh, oh yeah. Um, no, we couldn't have done so. It, it, it's worth reading the company through once without knowing what the submissions are to try and get a sense of the, the kind of bigger picture of the case. Because then when you get to the submissions and you kind of see how the facts have led up to that point, then it becomes easier to reread it and kind of understand, okay, I know that this event is going to happen, what happens in the build up to that? Or you'll notice, you know, you'll start noticing the legal things rather than the factual things. That's why I would suggest reading through at least once just to get a sense of, as I say, the story, the kind of broader picture of, of what the case is actually about and where this um, dispute has developed within. I mean, legal disputes only develop within a, a you know, they're kind of exceptional circumstances. So it's worth understanding what the normality was before these these disputes arose, um, because that will really kind of inform how you argue the case later on. Um, so yeah, read through, reread after seeing the submissions. Then I would suggest drawing up a timeline for the case. Um, the memorial you have this week looked fairly linear, but some years the memorial was all over the place. Sometimes it will start talking about a thing, you'll get to paragraph 20, and then it will introduce a new issue, it will jump back a year and a half, um, and again, you'll often find by the time you get to um, preparing your oral arguments, you'll find that actually some of the facts connect really interestingly. So for example, in our case, there was something about, um, there was a riot occurred on the basis of a number of, uh, of, of, of kind of, they, they denied something to the ethnic population. But then later on, there was a treaty argument about trade and when you put the two against each other, the trade argument actually caused some of the problems that led to the denial of the ethnic, uh, the, 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 the mineral to the ethnic population. And it wasn't made immediately clear if you just read the company once through. So it's useful to draw both a timeline for each submission. When does each action occur? When does this you know, uh, legal policy begin? When does the immediate effects start? But also then, putting these four submission timelines against a kind of master timeline um, and just making sure that you understand you know when is a public statement given when um, is a policy announced when is a policy rescinded um, that that can really help to get a sense of what the kind of facts are um, crucial start noting paragraph references as soon as you can um, one of Again, we'll talk about this more when we talk about oral argumentation. But it's quite hard to follow someone talking for 20 minutes, says the guy who has to talk for two hours. It's quite hard to follow someone talking for, for, for 20 minutes straight and, and pleading quite a conceptual case. I mean, something that you've been living and breathing for nine months and trying to explain it to a bench who have maybe only read the company that week. So if you can direct them to the paragraph references as you're going through your argument, it makes it so much easier for the judges to follow. So if you can say, if I can, you know, as it states in paragraph 35, this is when this occurred, or this statement, or can I direct you to this exact phrasing of the treaty? Um, so the sooner that, as you're drawing this timeline up, if you can note where the paragraphs of these timeline events occur, it will make it much easier for you to, to structure that argument later on. What you shouldn't do is reorder the compromise itself. Um, and I speak from experience, I tried this and it didn't help at all. Um, because you can download it as a Word document, I tried to reorder the thing as a coherent narrative. Um, it's just a waste of time. <laughs> and you can't explain that to the judges. 
So the more that you can work from the compromise itself, the compromise that everyone will be working with, your team, the opponent's team, the bench, the markers, everyone, the more that you can, you can work with that text immediately, uh, the better. So once you've done this sort of on your own, in a dark room, uh, at three in the morning, rereading the company over and over, you should meet with your team, you should schedule like a four or five hour meeting, and you should compare everyone's notes. Uh, because you will all have noticed things that are more interesting that uh, the, the others haven't, haven't noticed. Um, even your coaches. Your coaches will have noted lots of legal things, but they might have missed a little factual thing. Sometimes, sometimes not having a basis in international law can actually make you really helpful at the start of the Jessup. Because you're not, and again I speak from experience, our Helsinki team, we had a guy who'd never studied international law before. He'd done business law mainly. But when we were reading through it, he just was spotting facts that you miss when you're immediately going, okay, that looks like a human rights violation. How does that fit in with, with IHL or the Geneva Convention? Or how does this all sit? And he would say, oh, but this one person makes a statement and then someone from the government makes a different statement. And they're contradictory. And you'd be like, oh, that's, that's it. That unlocks like all of the arguments. So it's really worth... Yeah, comparing your notes and working out in that meeting what everyone's sense of the case is and possibly even starting to divide up the tasks for further research. Um, it can be helpful if somebody, for example, has a background in one of the submissions or you know, just particularly feels that the applicant is right. That person, it might be good to give them the applicant's um, section so that they can argue it um, convincingly. Uh, never stop reading the company. Uh, I know I mentioned this, that you'll notice things in February and March, but honestly, you'll be surprised that someone... The, the worst time for it to happen is in a pleading itself. I remember having my first pleading, and the other team cited a paragraph, and something in a paragraph. And, and I looked at the paragraph. I was sat... I was respondent, so I sat down, I looked at the paragraph and went... I can't swear, but the, the, I was like, oh no, I've like missed a key fact. So the more that you can... You can keep repeating it and reading through it, just making sure that you really understand everything that's going on in that universe. I mean, some of the, some of the paragraphs will be irrelevant. There's always red herrings. There will be things that there's normally a story about some individual who dies. As a human rights, we, we had a guy who killed himself in prison and he was very sad. His grandfather had died. And none of that was, none of it was relevant. None of it was legally actionable, but it's there to kind of give context. And what you'll see, particularly in international rounds, is that it's amazing what teams can do with the same set of facts, how they can kind of blend them together um, to make a different, a different kind of, yeah, a totally different narrative to the case. Um, so this is my comp, this is, this is the compliment from your case. Luckily it's blurry enough that you can't actually see the notes, but this is kind of how it looked after I'd gone through it a couple of times. Um, so kind of just underlining important things um, and then sort of noting at the side if there was something that twigged in my mind that seems like it might be this kind of legal source. Um, you can actually see the black pen was the second pass. So that was after I'd seen the submissions. I started noticing things that, was, that I understood how it fit within the case. Um, you'll probably go through about five compromises in the year. <laughs> Your first one will become a mess. You'll get rid of it when you start writing the argument, you'll start again, then you'll have one that you plead with once, then you, you'll write too many notes on it and you'll get rid of it again. Um, but that's good, it just shows that you're kind of drilling down into the sort of central part of the, of the company itself. So, uh, we'll start with the introduction to Iraq and then we'll take a, sh a short break and then we'll kind of speak through the end of it. Um, all, of the, all of the writing guides that we talked about at the start, uh, recommend that you structure your uh, written, written pleadings uh, in this form, IRAC. Um, issue, rule, application, conclusion. Have any of you ever worked, I don't know if you have the same acronyms, I don't know how it would translate to you training, but um, sometimes you're taught in law school what we call CREEK, conclusion, rule, explanation, application, conclusion. So, in that form, or as, as, as one of my lecturers told me, uh, tell the person what you're going to tell them, tell them it, and then tell them what you've told them. Um, you're often taught to do that in, in legal essays. Don't do that in the Jessup. 
Uh, firstly, because you'll lose points. There are stylistic things that they tell you not to do that with. But more importantly, the word limit in the Jessup is deliberately tight. You have to be concise. You have to make the arguments as quickly and as fluently as possible. And every word wasted is, is an argument that you have to cut somewhere else or uh, an explanation that you have to cut somewhere else. IRAC really helps cut down the word limit. It is a pain to write with at the start. Um, you will probably write, if you're taught the same way as I was, you'll probably naturally try to write with Creek. Just try and break out of that. One of the suggestions I would do when you get to the written uh, section of the, the preparations, and again, we'll talk about this more tomorrow, um, it can be useful to divide your page into four, four parts when you're writing. And these are sort of good um, generic starting lines for each section of it. So the issue should really just be the point in dispute between you and the other party. Um, it's not the legal source, it's not the, um, yeah, it's not the legal source, it's not the kind of argument itself, it's not, what, it's not your submission, crucially, it's not what you're going to conclude with, it's just what this issue is. The issue is whether um, the, treaty, the, the, the ICCPR applies between these two states. It's not about the ICCPR in general, it's specifically about whether it's applicable or um, whether this is a violation of Article 6 of the ICCPR. You need to be, it's the actual issue uh, in question between you. Um, the rule is where all of your law goes. Um, there should not be legal citations anywhere but in that section. Um, except from, of course, if the issue is ICCPR, then of course you can say Article 6 ICCPR. But don't cite a case somewhere else. You want all the law to just be neutral. So, again, taking the Article 6 case, uh, the question is whether such and such a fact is a violation of Article 6 of the ICCPR. Article 6 of the ICCPR has been interpreted by the Human Rights Committee in case, case, case. There they said this, this, this. You're just setting out the rule. You're not putting any of your own spin on it yet. Obviously, there's an, there's an element of how you present it that helps lead to the conclusion that you want. But the point is that the, the content of the rule itself is neutral. You just want to explain what the law is that governs that issue. Nothing else. The application is the heart of the Jessup, and that's what Wednesday is going to focus on. Um, which makes us a little bit confusing because we're not going to talk about how you actually write a full submission until Wednesday, even though we'll talk about the structuring of submissions tomorrow. But the application is basically the winning and losing of the Jessup. Um, it's where you take the facts, these ambiguous facts that are in the company, and it's how you link from the rule to the conclusion that you need to make. Um, so, yeah. And then the conclusion is simply whatever the point was that you had to reach in your submission. Um, a little hint that we'll develop on more over the next few days. As far as I'm concerned, the issue and the rule can and probably should be the same between both applicant and respondent. Because if you've identified the right issue and you've all found the same rules, then it's about how the facts match to those rules. You can't cherry pick some rules. If your if, if you're applicant and the respondent has found a case that really helps them, you can't just imagine that case doesn't exist. You might not put it first in your rule explanation, you might have to say, you know, however, there's also this. But you can't ignore the rule. Um, so this is just something to sort of think about when you start doing the research and then when you, when you, when you start writing. The, it's really when you bring the facts in is the point where you become applicant or respondent. Up until that point, you should be in agreement with what the, the issues are. Because, of course, also, when you get to the oral rounds, you're going to have to argue those issues with someone. So the judges will have an expectation of what they're going to hear. Your opponent will have an expectation of what are actually the problems. So you can't ignore certain issues just because they don't help you. Or you can't ignore certain rules because the first thing a judge will ask is, what about this case? and you tried to bury it under the rug and now you have to bring it up. So it's worth just thinking that the first two are essentially neutral and the third is, is where the, the Jessup actually happens. Um, so that's how the, the written part is structured. 
In terms of actually conceptualising how you research an issue, I think it's something closer to this. So the submissions that you're given in the compromise will give you the conclusions that you eventually have to reach overall. And we'll talk about how you actually structure that, but you know what the points are that you have to reach as applicant or respondent. You then need to work out how that divides into issues, the disputes between you and the other party. And then from there, you need to find the rules that govern those disputes. And what you'll end up doing is actually bouncing between two and three. So as you read the rules, you'll start with something. You'll say, OK, again, let's take the ICCPR. You'll say, OK, clearly there's a human rights issue here. So you'll look at the human rights stuff, and you'll go through the ICCPR, and you'll go, ah, OK, this article is relevant. So the issue will now be that article. And then you'll start reading the rules of how that article is governed, and you'll realize that there's a very specific meaning. There'll be a word in that, for example, if it's torture, like what is inhuman and degrading treatment, for example. So then the issue becomes, is it inhuman or degrading treatment? You go through all of the cases of what that. So you'll kind of refine the argument as the research goes. Um, the application is really the last part. Once you have these issues and rules, it's about working out how the facts can be fitted into that. Obviously, understanding how the facts go will, will, will determine the kinds of issues and rules that you identify. But the point is that you really shouldn't be thinking about, I think when you're doing the initial research at least, you shouldn't be thinking about how this wins your argument until you have a really strong knowledge of the law that governs this area. Of course, it's worth noting down whether a case is helpful for you or not helpful. You need to have that in your mind. But the crucial part, I think, in, at least in the first few months, is just getting the legal knowledge, making sure that you understand the regime you're talking about, the treaties you're talking about, how customary international law is formed, what the customary international legal rule would be. You need to have all of that before you can start applying it to the facts, because the worst thing that can happen is you get to December when you're writing the case, when you're writing the memorial, sorry, and you realize that there's a rule you've totally missed, or that you've been so focused on two paragraphs that help your case that you miss the next five that under, undo it entirely. I think you avoid some of that by focusing on the law first. Um, yeah, so we'll go through this and then we'll, we'll take a break so you can think about this. So the first question is finding the issues, the points in dispute. Um, so these are some kind of examples of things. I mean, is a certain action illegal or illegal is very broad. You would obviously want a specific form of international law. Is it a breach of Article 24? Is it um, a breach of, is it is a violation of the principle of um, non-intervention? Uh, but it would need to be a very specific issue. Or um, yeah, does a particular treaty apply? Or even is there a rule that governs this area? I mean, there are many areas of, inter or of international relations, international action, international politics, which are not governed by treaties at all. And you need to work out whether there is, a, is or isn't a rule that supports uh, or, or even considers that issue. Um, whether the state has standing to bring the claim, this is quite a common one. Uh, if you have an individual who's harmed, there's often the question of whether the state, because the ICJ is a court between states, the state needs to uh, have the ability to represent that individual internationally, which is different to a human rights claim, for example. So in the European court, if I was tortured, uh, and for, hopefully that won't happen, if I was tortured, I would go to the European court. It would not be the United Kingdom that would go for me. Um, whereas here, it is between two states, so it's quite often, quite often there's a question of standing. Or for example, if it's something that happens outside the territory of the state, that's another common one. Something happens on the high seas and this, the, the applicant state has no direct hand in what occurs. Do they have standing to then bring the other state to answer for that? That's quite a common one. So if yeah, someone is arrested in the territory of another state by the respondent and the applicant has nothing to do with it, can the applicant bring that claim? Um, the point with finding the issues is that, and we'll, we'll again talk about this a little bit later, but each point should be winnable. It should be something that either beats your opponent or means that you lose. So, for example, if the respondent argues that a treaty is not in force and they prove that to the court, 
then the submission is done, or at least that part of the submission is done, because then there's no legal basis to challenge that at the, the ICJ, or at least that legal basis is gone. Or, for example, if it's a question of whether something is or isn't a breach, that should be something that should be winnable by one side or the other. So don't argue something that's overly broad, like, are drones illegal under international law? I mean, you can't win that as a standalone submission. You need to break that down into components of international law that can be won. Or similarly, don't say something like, what would be an example of something that's too narrow, like, don't say something like um, I'm sorry, think there's, there's an example later in the slides that we'll get to, but there's, 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 you don't want to be too narrow either. You don't want to be a point that doesn't have any actual winning in the end. So for example, um, if it's a question of whether, whether the customary rule of principle of non-intervention exists, you don't need to prove that. The ICJ has like, said that repeatedly in, in cases that the principle of non-intervention exists. So you don't need a submission just to prove that. What you need is a submission that says, is this a violation of the customary rule of the principle of non-intervention? And you go through the cases that establish that rule, but you don't need a submission just to prove that that exists. Does that distinction make sense? It will maybe make more sense when we talk more about actually structuring the issues. So, what we'll do is take a quick five minute break and then we'll sort of shoot through the end of this. These are the first submissions in your, your case this, um, this week. I want you to think about what legal issues you can identify just from the submissions themselves. So obviously you know about the facts as well, but just looking at the submissions themselves, what kind of problems do you think are being suggested here? And what needs to be resolved between the two parties? So. If we get back at half past, we'll kind of go through an answer for that. But just if you can have a think of how you think these two submissions divide up into single packaged legal issues. Um, yeah, so let's take a five minute break and then we can pick up then. I'm, I'm, I'm sure if anyone's missing anything, been late. So does someone want to give an example of what, what they've identified as a, as a legal issue? Yes. Uh, for example, aggression, cessation, attribution, use of force. Okay, so those are those are more specific than I'm even meaning. I mean, that's good. That's good. For you. So, you've got good. so what was the what was the first one you said? Uh, aggression. Aggression. Okay. Uh, where did I see that? Uh, yeah. Well, so that's later on. We're going to get to where you see that because I know. Um, what What would you What would you um, put those terms under? If it's the question of so use of force, aggression. What's the actual problem here? Just looking at the text of the submission, like. I'm going to add highlighting to the submission. So, what words were you looking at when you when you wrote those ideas down? Strikes, uh, violate international law. Good. Okay. So you got the easy one. So, the drone strikes violate international law. I think that's that's uh, quite a simple one to spot. And the, the 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 respondent submission is that it's consistent with their rights under international law. So immediately that should get you thinking. Okay, what is the what are the international rules? that govern drone strikes that could be violated, that's what the applicant is arguing, and the respondent is saying that they have a right to use drone strikes, so what kind of rights uh, would legitimate the use of drone strikes? So that's the first one. Does anyone have another idea? Yep. Uh, the applicant uh, also raises uh, this mission that uh, the strikes are illegal uh, in Apple and in rest. That means that uh, the strikes, you know, for example, um, in uh, Adware is the use of force, as was said, and the strikes in Restia on its own territory, uh, it may lead to like it, uh, to the diplomatic uh, protection problem. Yeah, that's very good, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> but there's, there's an easier one that's highlighted before, so I can't click next. <laughs> there's an easier, there's another big issue, but that's very good, we'll get to that, the, the issue of, of where the, the acts take place. But there's a bigger issue. Terrorists. No. No, also, what does the last sentence in both submissions say? Yes. So, there's a question of remedies about whether the, 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 they can order the cessation. Um, and 
you noted actually both points. It's not just a question of the remedy requested, but the respondent is actually arguing the court has no authority. So that means you need to think about two things. Not only the question of the procedure for ordering cessation, but also what the court's remedial powers are in general. Um, so good. The next one has already been got, um, that the, the territory in which it takes place suggests that there might be separate arguments for respio versus aplia, um, and that as you identified, there might be different reasons to, um, different, different grounds for bringing this legal claim. You actually got the sixth one, there's six, sorry I lied, uh, I'd, forgotten about the, I'd forgotten about the court has no authority. There's also a sixth one, uh, which is the idea that terrorists are a unique class of people which is relevant for the legal consideration of the submission. So this is just to show you that even without looking at any of the facts, we now have identified two major issues and a number of sub-issues within those um, that immediately need research. Um, now, crime of aggression. There's other hints in the compromise for things that you can look for. Statements by the head of state are often a good one to, to, to keep an eye out for because, again, universe of the Jessup. Nonsense. Um, you are the legal advisor for a state that actually exists. And normally when states do things, they check that those things are legal. I think that's a fairly you know, normal statement to make. Um, so it's worth thinking about at each stage that something occurs in the compromise. What was your government thinking? What was the legal advice that was given to the government? You're not just at the ICJ making up a case to retroactively make everything okay. You actually are, you know, this isn't the, the truth but in, in most cases, but um, the idea is that you're going to ICJ to explain what the legal grounds were for each act that you made at the time. So it can be useful to go and find what your head of state said at various moments as to what they thought the legal justification was for their actions or what they thought the legal ground was or what the legal rule was or any other thing. So, for example, in paragraph 25, there's a statement from, I believe, the applicant. Um, and within that paragraph, there's a whole host of things. She says, no armed conflict, permitting the use of um, military force, even against alleged terrorists that there's no war because there are nations at peace, the question of Apia's sovereignty, there's the, mention, the explicit mention of the phrase act of aggression, um, although it's an act of aggression against the people of Apia. Um, and in the next paragraph as well, she goes on to say that she sees the, um, the entire drone program as a violation of rights under international human rights law and international humanitarian law. So if we go back to our example, we now have a whole list of things to go and research. So we have two whole bodies of law and how they intersect with drone strikes. We have a whole bunch of uh, explicit terminology, um, act of aggression, violation of sovereignty, uh, what the role of a war is, and then there's still the issues from before, who was targeted, um, what, where is it important where those acts occurred. Um, so it, it can be useful to kind of do this exercise as you read the compromise and as you read each paragraph and particularly each statement from heads of state. What did everyone think was the legal situation at the time? Because it's not, you know, when the drone strike was first launched, if we're, if we're believing the story of the compromise, when the drone strike was first launched, they didn't know all the things that would happen. Like you have the hindsight to be able to go back through, but it's worth considering at the time, what did they see? What was the, the, the actual facts on the ground? Now, you know, now that a hospital has been bombed, we can all say that the drone strikes were wrong. But did they believe that when they started the drone campaign? Those are the sorts of questions to think about. And when, when you know, if it takes until March for, her to, for the, the president to, cl to complain there's a violation of international human rights law, was there a violation before that? Or did something happen that made them cross that threshold? Um, this is why the timeline can be useful, to work out where each speech happens, where each legal claim happens, where each legal justification is given. If you can kind of chain these together, it will make understanding the whole legal case a lot easier. Uh, so we now have a whole bunch of stuff to, to, to research. 
but we still haven't actually dealt with the question of what rules, I mean, we've obviously dealt with them obliquely, but what rules are we actually looking at? So the Jesuits is a competition about public international law. What is public international law? Can someone give me a, give me a, give me a, without looking at the screen, which now has answers, what, what is the, what is the uh, definition of international law? Entities? Um, and, uh, entities such as uh, states, uh, international organizations, and something Okay. That's, that's a pretty good definition. I mean, the answer is that there's sort of no answer, particularly now there's so many discourses about what we actually mean when we talk about international law. The traditional con conceptualization is that international law is the law between states. And it's, and it's a voluntarist form of law, which means that the states who are bound by it are agreeing to be bound by it. There's no legislator. So you don't all necessarily agree to be bound by Ukrainian law, but because of the virtue of you being here, you are bound because there is a legislator above you. There's no above the states, is the traditional view. International organizations complicate that. The role of international courts complicates that the role of other international actors, private actors, transnational co corporations, if you're a Marxist, that's a real problem, uh, the NGOs, individuals, terrorists, non-state actors. Um, there's a, you know, a whole host of, of other explanations for what international law might or might not be. Uh, there's also a whole school of people who say that international law doesn't exist. Let's not even get into that debate. Um, but it's, uh, the, the point is that it's, it's an exceptionally broad concept in that it, international law regulates a whole host of things, but it's also a very specific way of speaking. It's a very specific kind of law and a very specific way of thinking about issues. Um, it's different from international relations to make an obvious point, or it's different from domestic constitutional law. International law has different um, trends and different pressures kind of existing underneath it. And that's what we're going to focus on on Wednesday, so I won't get too far into that. Um, but the question remains where we find international law. And luckily, the ICJ uh, statute gives you the answer of what the sources of law are. Now, you're going to have a lecture on this tomorrow, I think, from Sergey, so I'm not going to go into this in depth. But burn this into your mind. You should have this printed out on your pillow, above your bed, on the inside of cupboards, on the inside of your folder. Um, Article 38.1 is your Bible for the year. The question that everyone will ask you is the standard, is the standard uh, hungover judge who hasn't read the Compromise question is, uh, what is that source of law? Where do you get that from? How does that relate to the ICJ? And what they want you to say is this. And normally, so for example, if you want to say a judgment, Article 38.1d is the one that you hear all the time people saying, or if you want to say a uh, a lawyer or an academic or anything like that. Article 38.1d is just this answer that you have to learn to, to, to rhyme off and the guy will return to his hangover and kind of tick a box. So um, it shouldn't, be, shouldn't be that mean about the judges. The, the judges are all prepared, I, I promise you. Uh, <laughs> but um, this is, so these are the sources of international law for the purposes of the Jessup. Uh, treaties, custom, general principles, and subject to provisions of Article 59, judicial decisions, and the teaching of the most highly qualified publicists of the various nations. Um, we'll talk tomorrow and a little bit on Wednesday about how these sources interact. Um, as I'm sure Sergey will tell you tomorrow, there's no hierarchy of sources officially. Unofficially, it's much easier to say that a treaty is more enforceable than a principle of law, and particularly in the Jessup. This is something we'll, we'll talk about tomorrow. Because the Jessup is kind of, it's not fake, but because everyone knows that it's a game to test students and it's that often it's about how you interact with the bench as a bench from the ICJ, what you think the ICJ wants to hear, what kind of sources the ICJ likes to cite. Um, so there is an implicit hierarchy, but we'll talk about that tomorrow. But the point is that these are your, your four sources. Uh, I think every company gives you a list of the, the treaties that your state is party to. So this is a good place to start. 
look at this paragraph, go and look at these treaties, flick through it, see if there's something that leaps out as being about drone warfare or something. So, for example, you have uh, the ICPR, the Geneva Conventions, the Hague Convention. Um, these suggest some of the legal areas you might want to look in. Sometimes there are, uh, sometimes there are red herrings here. Sometimes there are treaties that aren't relevant or are only relevant if you make a certain kind of argument and aren't like kind of crucial to the arg to the, the case itself. Um, but often this is the best place to start for, for legal sources is to flick through. And it's always worth considering whether, so for example, the fact that the covenant on economic, social and cultural rights is there might be something you'd want to consider if it's not immediately about drone warfare, why is it there? Is there some way that that backs up another argument? Um, as you get into the deeper layers, you'll often find that these kind of subsidiary um, sources suggest something else about how the state is supposed to be behaving. And even if it doesn't directly regulate the legal issues, it might be important for understanding the kind of facts of the case itself. Um, but that's what you'll all discover this week when you're working in your groups. How do we find the law? Um, so, honestly, Google is quite good. If you type the, the name of most treaties into Google, they will come up. But there are the relevant bodies. There's the UN uh, Treaty Service. You can go to the ICJ to view their cases. There's the International Law of the Sea, uh, International, International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea. They have all their cases there. Um, there is, uh, in I think October and December, ILSA will release two batches of materials. This will be cases, articles, treaties, um, and other sort of legal documents, UN General Assembly resolutions. They're supposed to kind of point you in the right direction for the case. Uh, they do this so that everyone has a level playing field, um, partially because they just want to make sure that everyone roughly knows the right legal issues and partially because there's a disparity, obviously, in the level of resources for some countries, so it's useful for them to, to have. Everyone has access to the same basic information. What you'll normally find is that the, the first ILSA batch doesn't tell you much that's new. You'll have been researching the company by, for about four weeks at that point, and normally it's, I mean, they'll give you like some of the treaties that are there, They'll give you like Nicaragua, which everyone reads. I mean, there's these cases that always come up. And normally that won't surprise you. Um, there might be an article that will nicely explain something, but other than that, it normally just shows that you're on the right track, that you're, you are looking at the right things. The second batch in December can be more interesting. Sometimes they'll put things in there like articles uh, by, by academics that are more less legal and more kind of... Um, prescriptive, I suppose, and those can be interesting to read to kind of challenge your own assumptions sometimes. You'll also receive in October, November, um, access to the Max Planck Encyclopedia online. The Max Planck Encyclopedia is brilliant. Um, I actually worked for the Max Planck Institute, um, and they still use the encyclopedia. I mean, even in-house, we use it. It's brilliant. Um, I think I actually, have a, maybe it's later on, I have a photo of what it looks like. You can search, and it, it, it's articles written by um, pretty impressive, you know, important academics and it will be on every issue and it's a really good summary of sort of the history of the concept, the major cases, documents, state practice and it's really good to just again make sure that you've got kind of the full picture of everything. Uh, your library, your coaches, your lecturers, previous Jessup participants, um, anyone that you can ask, anyone that you meet here, I mean the other mentors, myself, Sergey, like uh, Email people, talk to people, but your, your, your library and your coaches are probably the best. If you go to the library and say, I'm looking for books like this, they can hopefully help you. If you have a, a dedicated law library, uh, help you find the, the, the texts that are most important. Um, yep, Google, if you add PDF to the end of stuff, sometimes it comes up. Um, that's what got me through my master's thesis. And um, it's worth subscribe, subscribing to blogs, um, particularly when you're in the later stages of preparing. It can be good to know, not only is the Jessup Compromis written deliberately ambiguously, but it's also normally written about legal issues that don't have a settled answer. Because otherwise, why would they bother? Why would they bother having you argue about whether you can invade a country? That's obviously illegal. Uh, so 
it can be good. Normally, the cases are based on some unresolved question, and it can be good to keep track of what the sort of current trends and, and um, debates are uh, in international law. So these are just some that are really uh, that are really good. EGIL Talk um, is the European Journal's uh, blog. It's brilliant. The people who write for it are great. Um, Volkrecht's blog is really good. Just Security and Lawfare are more about US law, but it's normally the inter intersection between US law and international law, or, or US law and constitutional law. They have a lot of stuff about drone strikes and things like that. Um, if you're doing things with human rights, it can be worth following some of the European court blogs, even though they are, as we'll talk about tomorrow, um, they're not binding on the ICJ because of the sheer number of judgments that the ECHR produces. It's often seen as a better determinant of where human rights stand than, for example, the Human Rights Committee, which puts out far fewer judgments each year. Um, the good thing about, I think, all of these blogs is that you can give them your email list, your email address, and they will email you each time a new article comes out. And it's normally got in the subject heading what it's, what it's about. So just keep an eye out. If something pops up, it might say, you know, drone warfare before the UK Parliamentary Commission, and you can read that, and it's like a few, you know, few thousand words and then it'll give you links to other things to look at. Um, here's suggestions of good general textbooks to get as well, particularly if you've not studied international law, it can be useful to, to get these. Um, yeah, James Crawford one is brilliant. Um, the Evans one is, if I remember correctly, a little bit more detailed, um, but also a little bit more specialist. It's an edited collection, so there's people writing on their frames of expertise rather than a sort of general the, the Crawford one is a very, um, it's, a, it's an overview of everything going on in international law. The Evans one is more specific. Uh, Clabbers' textbook, um, maybe it's because Helsinki bias, he's a lecturer there, but um, I really like this textbook. He does a good job, not only is Clabbers a good writer, and it's kind of fun to read, but he's also, there's, there's chapters on other debates in international law that are perhaps not just basic law. So there's some discussion of the rise of international institutions as a sort of developing global law, for example. And it can be useful to, you, you'd never want to stand up and cite those kinds of arguments before the, 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 the bench in the Jessup, but it's useful to understand where some of these um, legal regimes come into conflict. Now that we have human rights and trade law and all these different ways of looking at international action, the ways that those conflict and have to be harmonized is a is sort of it's been a pressing question for international law for at least the last 20 years and Clavers' book does quite a good job of situating some of the broader discussions um, in in that kind of context uh, so I, I would i would highly recommend it but but all three of them are excellent i'm sure if you know if your libraries have access to others um, they will they'll be equally good just try and make sure that they're up to date that's the only thing i would suggest and even i think the crawford one is now about five or six years out of date, so there are some problems with them that you just need to make sure that you're not citing something that's, that's now, um, now obsolete. Uh, so yeah, here's in fact Clabbers' book uh, with drone, youth drones use of in the index, and if you go to that page, there's like a little paragraph about it where he explains how it's, it's situated within the law of armed conflict in general, and he cites you, to points you to a, a UN document um, Something, again, we'll talk about this more tomorrow, I feel like that's my catchphrase today. Um, try and make sure that you're paying attention to primary sources more than secondary sources. So, if you read an academic's article and it's good and the argument makes sense, steal their footnotes and steal the argument, but make sure that you go and read the footnotes and cite those instead of citing the article itself. Because the ICJ doesn't really care if Jan Clavers thinks this is how drone warfare works, but they'll care if the UN rapporteur, or they'll care more if the UN rapporteur says it. Um, <clears throat> I remember actually being in a round where <clears throat> someone tried to cite a textbook, and one of the judges on the bench said, uh, he's a good friend of mine, and he's wrong, <laughs> uh, which was brutal. <laughs> um, and you'll see actually in the, fight, I mean, in the final rounds for the last two years, because Bruno Seaman uh, has done it two years, and Crawford has done it every time the draft articles and state, so the articles and state responsibility come up, 
they both had a hand in drafting them. So SEMA will sit forward and say, ah, yes, the, the, the articles of state responsibility. I, I'm quite interested in this issue, um, <clears throat> which is always fun to kind of watch, watch someone debate the person who wrote them about how they're to be interpreted. Um, so yeah, if you're going to read, I mean, the, the textbooks are great. And I would recommend, even if you think you have quite a good knowledge of international law, it's always good to check how people are situating some of these issues in the broader framework of international law, the broader history uh, of these regimes. And, and textbooks can be sort of the fastest way to find that. Um, that's uh, errant slide. Um, so one thing you can also do is, is take the treaties that you had in paragraph three and just type them into Google. So for example, here's the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights with drone strikes, and you get stuff from the Human Rights Committee, Human Rights Council, sorry. Um, it's also worth checking just with primary sources. So here's drone strikes and Security Council. You get a whole bunch of articles about the Security Council discussion of drone strikes. Uh, there's Drone Strikes Council of Europe. There's a really detailed report um, on drone strikes, which does a good job of assessing a lot of the basic international law governing this. Uh, that is the Max Planck. Um, which, yeah, you type in words and it will bring up every time that word is used. So sometimes you get a specialist page, like a special page for aggression. Sometimes it will be so breach of the peace, how aggression fits within that, or how it fits within use of force. Uh, but this encyclopedia is brilliant. Um, and yeah, you, you, the only problem is you don't get access to it until about October or November, so you, you'll have to do a lot of the research earlier on first, but it can be good to make sure that you're understanding everything correctly. Or sometimes you'll read a case and you won't understand that the case followed five other cases that developed that point, and the Max Planck can be very good at laying the kind of history of each debate out. Uh, this is a general Google for Drone Strikes International Law, which turns up an academic paper, that's where the footnote should be. That's why that slide is not moved properly. So as I was saying, just go to the, when you read a paper like that, go to the footnotes and comb these for primary sources. Write them down. Make sure that you're checking every source that the academics are writing on as well. Um, because many of the judges will be, for the Jessup will be academics. The people who write the problem will be academics. They'll be engaged in this kind of thinking. So learn what they're talking about. Find the texts that they all think are, are kind of foundational to talking about these issues. Um, and finally, EGIL talks can take in drone strikes. It will give you a bunch of up-to-date debates on drone strikes. And there's the actual European Journal of International Law. You can also search for drones there. Um, the European Journal is perhaps not the best journal. It's quite theoretical. But some of the other ones, you can do this and just find out what the current trends are. So best advice for starting out, try not to get tunnel vision. It's really easy to be like, okay, crime of aggression, crime of aggression, drone strikes, I can find this and not understand what the crime of aggression is, what it was originally brought into being for, where that definition comes from, how it's been used by different courts. So the more that you can gain a, a holistic picture, the better. Um, try and keep track of everything you read. And if you see something being repeatedly cited, write that down, have a list of things that you have to read. Um, I am the worst person for opening 45 tabs, I mean, as you can see in the screen grabs. Uh, none of these have them. Oh, there we go. You can see them behind the second window. There's a pile of tabs. Um, so try not to do that because it's really easy to just get nothing done with a day. You'll just go down the, the, the rabbit hole and not find anything. Um, so try and be structured. Try and make sure that if you're seeing a case cited, that you read that case immediately before you kind of push on with the rest of the research. Uh, as I said, be neutral, don't cherry pick, don't avoid things because they seem difficult for you. If something is difficult, it actually means you should run towards it. You should find out why it's difficult, find out whether it actually has anything to do with your case or not. And if it doesn't, then you can put it aside. And if it does, you need to work out how to fit that within the framework of your thinking. And always keep checking against the compromise. This isn't to say that you should be writing your actual argument, but just as you read about, so for example, as you start reading about drone strikes, you might see something about the question of proportionality. So then you can go back through the compromise and see, did anyone mention proportionality? What is proportionality? What kind of numbers are balanced in proportionality? Do we have those numbers? Do we not have those numbers? Um, that's how you'll be able to refine the broad issues down into the actual points of dispute between each state. And then, yeah, you can begin to separate them out. 
um, by different sources, by how these sources need to be established for you to argue on them. And it can be helpful if you're working in the situation where you've already split into teams. It can be helpful to sit with your counterpart. So if you are applicant to sit with your respondent and both explain to each other what, you're, what you found that week. And they can say, oh, well, have you read this case? It says that you're wrong. And it's good to, to kind of compare that. Um, and yeah, be precise. So, so yeah. Don't say drone strikes violate international law. Don't also just ask if a treaty applies, if it clearly does. You need to be, again, bearing in mind the word count that the memorial uh, imposes on you. You need to be as, as uh, concise and precise as possible to ensure that you're getting the most out of every argument. Um, tomorrow, we're going to look at how this actually works in practice. So we're going to talk about how you write a memorial, how you go about beginning to write a memorial, the kind of requirements for that, and then how you convert that 40 page um, brick into something that you can argue in under 20 minutes uh, to a bench that are hammering you with questions and with an opponent that disagrees with you on the other side of the room. Um, are there any questions on that, on, on this? I'm going to give you, okay, I'm going to talk to you about Thursday. So uh, instead of giving you a lecture on Thursday, we're going to do a little practice on public speaking and generally interacting with um, a hostile audience, let's say. So uh, don't worry about this. It's not like a big deal. I just want you to talk, be able to stand up here and talk for two minutes on any issue uh, of your choosing. Preferably something that we can all understand and we can ask you questions about. So don't pick something super arcane or something that, you know, uh, we don't understand. It doesn't need to be legal. If you want it to be legal, if, you've, if you read an article this week that you think is interesting and you want to stand up and talk about that, or if you want to talk about an essay you've written recently, or the Ukrainian criminal law, or whatever, um, feel free. Uh, the first minute will only be for you to speak, and in the second minute you can expect some light questioning from the audience. Nothing too bad, but just to get an experience of what it's like to have someone Someone ask you about what you're speaking, what you're talking about, and be able to stick to the structure, to answer them and get back to what you're talking about. Please don't stress about this. Apart from that, you have a massive workload this week, so I don't want this to take up a lot. But um, when, we've talk, when we talk tomorrow and on Wednesday, less on Wednesday, but when we talk tomorrow about how the oral rounds work, this is just to give you some practical ex experience before pleading on Saturday of what it's like to, to have someone question you on things like this. Don't write a speech if you can avoid it. I mean, I appreciate, and I have to say I have like the utmost, um, the utmost respect and utmost admiration for the fact that you're all going to compete in the Jessup in your non-native language. That's incredible. I, I'm monolingual. So it's, it's phenomenal that you can do that. But the quicker that you can get away from writing a speech that's carefully plotted out, and the more you can get to, I mean, notes like this. This is two hours of notes. The more you just have, I didn't even look at, but the more, the more you have bullet points that you know you just need to hit in your argument, and the more that you can just speak fluently around that, uh, the better. So I would recommend just, you know, you can write a speech to get a sense of what you're going to say, but try and get that down to just the markers, and try and ensure that it's around a minute and a half long, I would say. Be prepared to speak for two minutes, but... Have a, have a clear structure of beginning, middle, and end. This should be about a minute and a half, and expect a couple of questions that may ask you to elaborate on something or move on to something else, but that you'll still be able to get back to your ending. So yeah, if there's five things to focus on, make sure that you're, what you say is clear, that someone listening to this for the first time in two minutes with no written idea of what you're gonna say, that we can understand your chain of thought. Focus on structure, ensuring that the, the speech has a nice uh, flow to it. And again, that will help with the clarity. If there's clear markers of what you're going to say, um, it's easy to follow. Ensure that it's within the time. Ensure that you're confident. We'll talk a little bit about how to do that tomorrow, but just ensure that you, are, you look good when you're speaking and you look believable. And uh, your pace of speaking is maybe the most important thing that the Jessup will teach you. I'm still terrible at it. Scottish people talk fast. I naturally speed up. 
I'm aware I was doing it um, today. Uh, but the more you can, you can start to focus on, on speaking in that way, once you kind of learn the Jessic cadence, um, it, will make, it will make all of the above easier. Once you can nail this, you'll appear more confident, which will make you be more confident. You'll have a better management of where you are in your argument, how your timekeeping works, and it's much easier for someone to follow when you speak at this pace and you explain that this is what you're going to talk about. Uh, if you are talking like this and you're talking about criminal law and blah, 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 it just will lose people. Bearing in mind in particular that in the Jessup, the benches are often non-native speakers themselves, um, or they are native speakers. But it, it, you know, obviously, the, it's a global competition. The majority of people pleading are non-native, and you hear every version of uh, accent and every pronunciation of aplia um, and respia uh, under the sun. Um, but the more that you can make your speaking clear, the easier it is for, for every bench to follow you and to give you the high scores. Um, I know that was kind of a breakneck lecture. Does anyone have any questions about this or about the rest of the week or in general about the Jessup that I can help with? Is there anything at all? Did everything make everything clear enough? Cool, okay, thank you, I'll see you all tomorrow.